Okay, everyone, so let's uh, get on with the uh, questions for tonight. Uh, all right, so we start from the top. Uh, okay, dear Ajahn, can you explain a little more why it is so important asking oneself uh, uh, what is the reason for the uh, eventual change after a meditation? Uh, uh, thank you for inspiring teaching. Okay, so uh, the reason is simply to learn about your mind, uh, yeah, how your mind works. So you want to learn about uh, what are the perceptions, what are the intentions that lead to good meditation? How do you work with your mind in a good way? Uh, and what you will discover usually is that there are some very simple things that you do. Uh, for example, you find out what relaxation really means. One day you really relax, uh, another day you don't. And then you understand the difference. Uh, what it means to let go, what it means to sit back, what it means to just be in an armchair and or watching the sunset or whatever. Uh, and so you can see yeah, what kind of these very simple little things that actually work for meditation. What does it mean to guide your mind towards appreciating your own kindness and generosity on the path? What does it mean to appreciate the Buddha as a teacher? How do you direct your mind? When does it work? These are the things that you reflect on afterwards. So you can see yeah, what are the kind of how this whole process works. And this is important. I mean, further down the track, yeah, there's deeper things that you watch. And you watch the actual impermanence and the dukkha and how things fade away. We'll come to that at the very end of the Anapanasati Sutta. But in the meantime, you just want to know all the kind of basic things that allow you to become peaceful and allow you to enjoy the joy and the happiness and these kind of things in your meditation practice. So watch yeah, and see what perceptions work for you. How do you direct your mind in the right way? Yeah? What are your intentions that are at work, etc., etc.? Yeah? And then gradually you become uh, used to acquainted with your own mind, how it functions, and then you can guide yourself in the right way. This is the idea behind this. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay, so see what happens there. Okay, Unitarian College, 150th anniversary, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's not the question, this, this is the question coming up. Is it better to live as a single, in general, as a lay when practicing Buddhism? Is it better to live in single, uh, as a single? It can be, uh, it really depends on whether you enjoy single life or not. Uh, yeah, if you don't enjoy it, maybe it's not best, uh, but if you enjoy it, great, wonderful, because it gives you you have fewer distractions, uh, yeah, you have more time for yourself, you can do what you want, you become like a little monastic uh, in your little apartment. Uh. <laughs> That's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, and I know many people who actually do live a single life as lay people, and they are really good meditators and really good practitioners, and they are wonderful people, uh, and they have a lot of success uh, living that single life. Uh. But uh, it's not, there's never any kind of straight answers to these things. It, I mean, some people really don't like uh, single life. They find it really hard. It makes them depressed and sad and they want to have someone around to talk to or whatever it is. And then maybe life with a partner is better for those kind of people. So there isn't any kind of obvious and absolute answer to these things. It depends on how you're able to deal with it, how you're able to create the best possible mind states. What matters is whether we can make progress or not. What matters is if you're able to develop good qualities in your mind, how do you most easily develop compassion, loving kindness, all of these things towards other people? That is the best way for you to live. Yeah, so there, there isn't kind of any, any one single answer to these things. Um, it may also be that in different times of your life, different things are right. Sometimes maybe living with a partner is right, or other times it may be living by yourself is right, depending on the circumstances. Uh, yeah, maybe you develop during your life and that, that changes things. Uh, you may start off as a lay person and become a monastic. Yeah, you may change from having a relationship to not having one, etc. etc. Uh, so, uh, the advice the Buddha always gives uh, is that the only thing that matters uh, is that you are increasing in wholesome qualities uh, and going down in unwholesome qualities. Uh, 
That is what matters. Uh, and the right choice for you is what makes that work, that process work. Uh, if you're increasing in unwholesome qualities and going down in good qualities, you've got to make some change uh, quickly, rapidly, before you die. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be too late. Uh, so get on with it. Uh, there's, a, there's one of my favorite little suit that I can I should never save papers because I always said that with every suit I kind of get silly after a while. So but one of the kind of little passages that I remember very clearly from the suit is, uh, is a passage from the sutta called the um, uh, called Vanapada Sutta, like jungle thickets or something to that effect. Uh, and in that sutta, the Buddha says, you know, when you are with a certain teacher, if you find that you are improving under a certain teacher, you should hang out with that teacher, you shouldn't leave that teacher. And then he says that even if that teacher tells you to leave, even if that teacher tells you to leave, you should not leave. Yeah, because if you are, if you are having success with your meditation, if things are going well and you are increasing in good qualities, yeah, that means that you are fulfilling the spiritual life. Yeah? Things are actually working in the right way. Yeah? And so you should stay with our teacher. Yeah? You're having success. Yeah? So even if you are told to leave, yeah? no, I'm going to stay here. Yeah? I remember we had a monk in our many years ago, and he said that if I'm told to leave, I'm going to chain myself to the front gate of the monastery. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, it didn't last that long. But anyway, that's a different, uh, that's a different story. <laughs> Sometimes if you're too eager, that's also bad, right? Because it somehow doesn't work. You've had to be a bit cool about these things. So, so um, yeah, so that is, uh, that is the general advice. I hope we can make use of that. Uh, okay, so it seems to have become the norm to put down animals when they are sick. I understand this goes against the precepts of not killing living beings. However, non-Buddhist friends suggest that it's actually more compassionate to put the animal out of their pain. What are your thoughts? How would this relate to somebody on life support machine that is turning off the switch killing it? Um, it depends, yeah. Um, Compassion for an animal really depends on whether that animal wants to live or not. And one thing is that the animal may be in pain, but sometimes you want to live even though we are in pain. If you are in pain, do you want to be put down? <laughs> Probably not, right? Okay, just got a bit of pain, give me a few pills and I'll be right. But don't, don't put me down, please. I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> And animals are a bit like that, right? Uh, animals are the same. They also have a very strong will to live. We all have a strong will to live. Uh, there comes a point, of course, where the pain becomes so unbearable that we are ready to die. So our job is to try to feel what the animal state of mind is like. Uh, because animals uh, are, in so many ways, very similar to us. Uh, and Ajahn Brahm has this nice idea. I don't know if it always works, but it's the idea of asking the animal uh, would you like to die? And kind of feeling the response, yeah. Sometimes there's a lot of unspoken communication. Well, it has to be unspoken with animals, but there's a lot of kind of unspoken communication going on between you and the animal there. And there's lots of interesting scientific research about dogs, for example, who know that the owner is coming back home. Have you heard about that kind of research? The uh, British uh, scientist called Rupert Sheldrake who is very controversial in traditional scientific circles, but he's a very interesting uh, scientist nevertheless. Uh, he, uh, he graduated in biology from, uh, he had a PhD from Cambridge University. Uh, and a very brilliant person in many ways, but has gone completely his own ways. Uh, and he did this research on dogs and whether they can feel that the owner is coming back home. And what he found is that the dog would come to the door of the house roughly about five minutes before the owner would return. That was quite a common thing, apparently. So there is some communication, it seems, going on there, more on the mental kind of level. So you can ask your pet and see what it feels. And maybe you have an intuition that the pet actually is ready to die. Had enough. Yeah, I don't want to live anymore. And I would say in that case, compassion may be the right thing. Human beings, it is the same thing. Yeah? If a human being wants to die, I don't think personally that we have the right to tell people that they have to live. This is kind of what our society has been like. And I think it comes from all the Christian values in Western society, yeah? that even if people want to die, we tell them, no, sorry, you have to live. We're going to force you to live against your will. Yeah? 
Is that compassionate? I don't think so. I think we should have the right to decide over our own lives. Yeah, if we want to die, in Western Australia, recently they passed the law what is called voluntary assisted dying. So if you really have a good grounds for wanting to die, you've had enough. Uh, certain safe, uh, you know, loops have to be gone through so that you to ensure you don't do things uh, kind of for the wrong reasons. Uh, but if you have the right medical condition and you have the right psychological. Uh, examination or whatever, and you are, uh, you know, you are in a, you, your mind is in the right state or whatever, then uh, you have the right to die given these uh, uh, certain circumstances. Uh, and I think that is, uh, to me, that's reasonable. Uh, um, I had a very interesting experience myself. We had a, a disciple, uh, he was actually English, uh, he was from down Wiltshire or something like that, uh, and he asked me, uh, he said he had one of these. Uh, uh, motor neuron diseases how it gradually kind of your, your whole neuro neurological system starts to disintegrate and eventually you can't do anything uh, except just lying in bed uh, yeah and he said that when he, his quality of life reaches that stage he doesn't really want to live anymore because you know you become a burden for others and you can't really do anything and kind of their life just becomes pointless so he asked me what should he do uh, and when you are a monk, you have to be very careful when you answer those kind of questions. Uh, I can't just tell him, yeah, in that case, absolutely die, yeah, that, you know, go through it. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if I say that, I will have a, get a paradigm offense, I won't be a monk anymore, because if he follows my advice, that is. Because uh, you cannot really tell people and cause other people to die. Uh, but what you can do, you can tell them of the karma that you might incur, right? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing from a karmic point of view? Uh, and what is important to understand from the point of view of kamma is that kamma is always decided by the motivation that drives your actions. And as long as your motivation is good, yeah, you're coming from compassion, wisdom, wholesome motives, then it can never really be bad kamma. So what you should ask yourself if you want to die, why do you want to die? That is the critical question. And if you feel sure about yourself that this is coming from the right place, then you're probably fine. Yeah? I can never tell you that yes, it is right to die because I can't read your mind. You should be happy about that, right? I can't read your mind. But anyway, I can't read your mind. So, so uh, um, that is what you have to decide for yourself. But the basic idea is that if your motivation is good, you're okay. Yeah? But watch and be very clear about what your motivation is. So and that is both animals and human beings. Um, if somebody is on life support and they are not conscious, what do you do then? Uh, well, then it's a bit more tricky because uh, ideally you ask them beforehand, yeah? Uh, you should have some idea of what they want to do. Uh, uh, if you feel confident that they want to die, then uh, it may not, be, uh, may not be wrong, but you have to be really confident. Uh, people often don't want to die. They want to kind of give it a chance. Uh, uh, so you have to yeah, try best to figure out what's going on here. All right. Dear Ajahn, since I become a Buddhist not long ago, my family complains I become increasingly pessimistic, always talking about dukkha. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you should talk more about sukha, right? Uh, enough about dukkha, talk about sukha. And uh, say that um, uh, the Buddhist path is all about happiness. Uh, and this is one of the things I can't remember. I have forgotten already which suttas I have included for this retreat. But anyway, uh, one of my favorite suttas, uh, and I should not say this again, why am I saying this every time? Uh, one sutta, <laughs> uh, I enjoy reading most suttas, but one sutta, it, has, it talks about the psychological process of meditation, what meditation feels like uh, from a first person perspective. Uh, yeah, and this is just so extraordinary when you see what that is like. And I, I teach this sutta almost on every meditation retreat. Uh, but it starts off as a, a sequence of uh, mental states, one leading to the next one. Uh, and it starts off with virtue or morality or kindness, or however you want to translate it. Uh, that leads to non-regret, uh, yeah, abhipati sari in the Pali. Non-regret, this is like a deep sense of non-regret, uh, where even you feel happy about your conduct, leads to pamuja, which is like joy or gladness. Uh, the pamuja leads to piti, which is even more gladness, a yeah, deeper kind of gladness. Uh, 
that uh, gladness leads to pasandi, which is tranquility, deep sense of peace and stillness and satisfaction. Uh, that stillness leads to sukha, which is even more happiness. Uh, that <laughs> happiness leads to samadhi, which is an even deeper form of tranquility. And when you start to look at that sequence, uh, yeah, it is just all about happiness through and through and through. Uh, Every stage of this path is about happiness. Uh, every stage of meditation, uh, if you get it right, is one happiness more profound than the previous one. One state of peace more profound than the previous one. Going on and on and on uh, until you are uncertain whether you can even take all this bliss. Yeah? It's like, I can't deal with all this, too much bliss. Uh, <laughs> I was in, uh, in Poland just before I came to the UK and I was uh, traveling around five different cities in Poland. I had a really enjoyable time in Poland, by the way. So much Buddhism in Poland. I was just really impressed uh, with Poland. Uh, so uh, anyway, I was traveling and there was one of these people I was talking to and he said he had this one meditation experience uh, but the bliss was so profound uh, that he was scared afterwards of going back again because the bliss was just so utterly overpowering. Yeah. And that is kind of the sort of thing that gradually, yeah, the reason it felt overpowering was because it wasn't really used to it. It came too fast. Uh, but once you get used to these things, yeah, it is like the bliss that literally are, is out of this world uh, because it is out of this world. Uh, that's kind of the point of this path. Uh, and uh, that is kind of where this is leading, yeah. So tell this to your family, right? It's like uh, the bliss that leads to the very to the discovery, in fact, of the meaning of life. That's what it is about. Yeah. But it's actually even more uh, basic than that, because the Buddha talks about the various kinds of happiness in the gradual training. Yeah. When you live uh, with kindness in your life, you feel good about yourself. Uh, and that is a kind of happiness, the happiness of, again, feeling... Um, it's like non-remorse, if you like. Or what is the word that he used again? Blamelessness. Blamelessness, thank you. Yes, the happiness of blamelessness, exactly. Yeah. And uh, then you get to, again, yeah, so everything, in a sense, has to do with happiness on the Buddhist path. We are generous because generosity leads to our happiness and the happiness of others, happiness all around. Yeah. Everything is aimed at happiness. Yeah. The problem with the idea of dukkha, it is often too profound for people to uh, really understand or to grasp uh, because dukkha is really an insight, yeah? Uh, an insight that takes a very high level of samadhi and stillness to be able to see these things clearly. Uh, so dukkha cannot really be understood properly. Uh, and because of that, when we talk about dukkha to everyone, we're talking about things that are really beyond people's reach. Uh, and that's why it sounds so pessimistic. Uh, uh, because a lot of the dukkha we talk about is a dukkha of uh, five khandas and, and these kind of things. Uh, so we have to balance it out. Uh, and uh, some people, they need to hear the sukha side. Some people, the dukkha side, and probably the majority of people, a bit of both. Uh, we need the carrot and the stick. Some people just want carrot. Uh, some people just want stick. Whack, whack. <laughs> <laughs> some people need a bit of both, right? Uh, and uh, this is actually from the suttas. Uh, this is actually strip, or not the whack, whack part, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the stick, the idea of being motivated by dukkha, sukha, and both, that's actually from the suttas. Uh. So there you are. Okay, so dear Ajahn, could you please tell a bit more about uh, devas enhancing our meditation? Uh, devas enhancing meditation, okay. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what you are referring to here, but... Um, uh, there is something called the Devata Nusanti, the recollection of the Devas, uh, right? Maybe that is what you are referring to. Uh, and uh, by recollecting the Devas, you can gain some joy. The Devas are the kind of, uh, bu the kind of the, um, beings in the heavenly realms. Uh, I don't like to call it gods, because God has a very different idea from Christianity. It doesn't really work. But call it beings in heavenly realms. Call it human beings in heavenly realms, right? Uh, Maybe not, yeah, okay, whatever, something like that. Uh, and uh, the idea with the recollection of the devatas, uh, devata is just another word for deva, um, is that uh, you know, if you have an idea of these beings, uh, the reason why they were born in those realms, uh, those conditions they created to be born there, are the same conditions you are creating now as a human being. 
Yeah, and when you think about those devas, yeah, they are like luminous beings. The word deva is uh, derived from diva. Diva means day. Day means like bright. Yeah, so brightness. They are bright beings. Uh, they are more powerful. They are more happy. They have less dukkha. They have <laughs> dukkha again. They have more sukkha, less dukkha. They have less problems. Uh, and so, and often very contented. Yeah, if the higher up you go into these various realms, the more contented the beings are. The Tusita Devas literally means the contented realm of Devas. Uh, contented means like really chilled out. Yeah, wow, the life is just really easy. Yeah. And so this is the idea, yeah, that you are actually moving, regardless of whether you attain, you know, all the way the end of the path or not. M- most people don't. Uh, at least you get the consolation prize. Uh, yeah, that's called the is Deva Loka rebirth, yeah. It's okay. You don't have to feel embarrassed about that. Sometimes I get feeling Buddhist people say, yeah, no, Deva Loka, that's kind of below me. Yeah. But actually, that's just being silly. Because <laughs> it's being really silly, right? Because the reality is that taking this path all the way is quite challenging for most people. It's not that it's difficult. The idea is not hard to understand. Yeah. But it's just dealing with our own mind, overcoming our defilements. It, actually, it's challenging here. Yeah. And so if you do get reborn as a deva, and maybe you can continue your practice there, it's okay, it's fine. Don't think that you know, somehow that is bad, or the deva loka is kind of a, you just get trapped, I'm going to determine to be reborn as a human being in my next life, because that's kind of, I'm really, I'm, I'm tough, I'm going to practice the path or whatever. And if you think like that, you know, I think a lot of people, if they, determine at the time of the death, I'm going to be reborn as a human being here. Yeah. You're just going to mess it up, huh? yeah? We don't really know how to do that properly here. Yeah. And you're going to kind of, your mind is going to kind of start thinking about all kinds of things and eventually you don't have no idea where you're going to get reborn. Yeah. So I think the best way when you die is just to relax on your deathbed, yeah. enjoy the process of dying. Yeah. For good people, yeah. the process of dying is beautiful. Yeah. It's a pleasant thing, yeah. Because you're being released from a body that is often sick and tired and had enough. Uh. But that is how you do the Deva Tanusati. These beautiful beings, you're heading in that direction. Uh. The very fact that the Buddha teaches this kind of contemplation uh, must mean that it is okay to have some idea of being reborn in this realm, being a good thing. Uh. So uh, that's how it works, basically. Uh. All right. <clears throat> I was lucky enough to have also been on your previous retreats here five years ago. Yay! Thank you for teaching us again. You are very welcome. I'm not sure who you are, but anyway, that's fine. <laughs> the Buddha said to Ananda that good companionship is the whole of the holy life. What did he mean? Thank you. I'm very glad you asked that question because that is a very a good question indeed, and it's something that I usually talk about on uh, on every retreat because it's such a meaningful thing to talk about, uh, and um, it's it's fascinating. It comes from a sutta where uh, Venerable Ananda, who is the Buddha's attendant, uh, he goes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha, he says. Uh, Venerable Sir, it is marvelous, it is amazing, the importance of good friendship. It is half the holy life. And the Buddha says, not so, Ananda, not so. Good friendship is the whole of the holy life, of the spiritual life. And uh, I remember when I first read that, I thought, yeah, yeah, the Buddha's exaggerating here. Yeah, because it feels too much. So what about uh, all the other factors of the path, right? You've got to be generous, uh, you've got to be kind, you've got to have all of these moral rules, uh, you should meditate a little bit, uh, you should reflect like the Buddha, you should have a right view, you should learn to perceive in the right way, develop certain perceptions of impermanence. Uh, there's all of these factors on the path. Uh, so how can spiritual friendship be everything? Uh, how is that possible uh, and the answer is really, I think, quite simple. The answer is that without a Buddha in the world, there is no way out. The way out is blocked because of the delusion of human beings. So a Buddha arises, the Buddha is said to be the eye of the world, because the Buddha sees first, and then he passes on the teachings to us. 
He has seen the world. He opens up the possibility for us also to practice those teachings. Without the Buddha, it is really impossible. You have to become, or you have to become a Buddha yourself, but unfortunately there is no path to becoming a Buddha. So that's kind of random. You can't really decide to become a Buddha. The only thing you can decide to become is an Arahant. So we rely on someone, someone, yeah, it can be anyone really, but someone to become the Buddha, then the path is opened up. And then you have the possibility of practicing this life. That is why it is the whole of the holy life. Without that Buddha, without that Kalanamitta, there is no starting even on this path. But it is more than that. One of my, no, one sutta I like. <laughs> okay, mindfulness arose again just in time. Uh, so, uh, one, another sutta I like, this is called the Avijna Sutta, found in the numerical discourses, the tenth number 61. And this is a sutta that talks about all the conditions that give rise to awakening again. Yeah, And it goes back, one stage, back, 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 all the way to like the source, yeah, the, the root cause of awakening, if you like. Yeah. So it starts off with awakening. It says that the, uh, the uh, condition for awakening is the seven awakening factors. The condition for that is the four satipatthanas, the four mindfulness meditation. The condition for that is the three kinds of good conduct. And it goes stage by stage by stage, all the way back to sapuri sangseva, which means association with superior people. That is the root cause. Yeah, association with superior people. Who are these superior people? Well, they are the Buddha, first and foremost, or anyone who has the same kind of insight as the Buddha. Right? That is a root cause. This is the same idea as the Kalanamitta being 100% of the holy life. This is the foundation. Without that, the whole process of awakening doesn't even get started. Yeah, and so there's like, from that idea, from the hanging out or associating with the superior people comes the hearing of the good Dhamma. The good Dhamma is the Dhamma of the Buddha. Yeah? The Dhamma that is about the truth, if you like, the real spiritual path, the truth of the mind and human condition, etc. From that comes then faith or confidence. From that comes Yoni Somana Sikara, I think. Yeah? From that comes Sati. Yoni Somana Sikara is wise attention. From that comes Sati Sampajanya, mindfulness and full awareness, I think this is the sequence, I'm getting a bit muddled, from that I think comes sense restraint, from that comes the three kinds of good conduct, from that comes the mindfulness meditations, from that comes the seven factors of awakening, from that comes knowledge and liberation. I think that's roughly the sequence. So one thing leading to the next one, right? But it starts with associating with superior people. And there's a beautiful simile that goes with this. And the simile is as follows. Uh, yeah, the Buddha said it's like the, the rain on the mountaintop. Uh, yeah, the associating with the good or superior people is like the rain on the mountaintop. Uh, and when it rains on the mountaintop, uh, the rain starts to kind of accumulate down the sides uh, and it forms into little creeks. Uh, yeah, and those little creeks they run down the mountain. Uh, yeah, and then those little creeks uh, they merge into little rivers. Uh, and those little rivers go into the small lakes. And then the small lakes overflow into the larger rivers. The larger rivers go into the large lakes. And the large lakes, they overflow and they go into the big rivers, like the Ganges River. The Ganges River is absolutely enormous. It makes the Thames look like some kind of tiny little creek in comparison. <laughs> and then, of course, the Ganges River goes into the ocean, right? And then that Ganges River, this enormous river, I don't know if you have crossed the Ganges at Patna, it's like two kilometers wide or something, it's absolutely humongous, that fills up the ocean. And so here the idea is that if you keep on hanging out with the superior people, if you keep on associating with the Buddha, if you keep on reading the suttas, because that is how we associate with the Buddha nowadays, if you keep on Having friends like people who are superior in this world, keep that rain going. Keep on reading those suttas. Keep on being brainwashed. And as that brainwashing works on you, the rains down the mountain, it fills those creeks, right? 
And you have, all you have to do is keep on and listen to that Dhamma. It has to keep on raining. If the rain stops, uh, it is never going to reach the ocean. But if the rain keeps going, uh, eventually it will all go to the ocean. Uh. All you have to do is to hang out, listen to those teachings, allow yourself to be inspired by these beautiful teachings of the Buddha. And as you do that, eventually you will go to the ocean. And of course the ocean here is the simile for Nibbana, right? This is found in the Anguttara Nikaya 1061, if you're interested in looking up that particular sutra. So keep the rain coming. Yeah, Never stop the rain coming. Go back to the suttas, understand the word of the Buddha, be inspired by the Buddha. I will talk a little bit more later on about the Buddha, how to be inspired by the Buddha. I love this idea of thinking about the Buddha. There's something very... Uh, we need to relate to the Buddha somehow. Uh, we think that the Buddha lived two and a half thousand years ago in a different culture, uh, which is kind of true, uh, but it's also not quite true. Uh, and I will tell you why later on. Uh. So that is the one about the Kalya Mitla being 100% of the uh, spiritual life. Okay, so next one. Dear Bhante, you mentioned there is no evidence in the suttas for the concept of mindfulness begets mindfulness. You mentioned two other things instead. Could you please elaborate them and give sutta references and explain how to properly practice mindfulness in daily life? <laughs> Uh, sure, I can. Of course, I can do that. I'm very, I don't, so very happy to do that. So the um, actually, I do think it, it may be one of the suttas I included later on. But anyway, I'll give you some quick yeah, ideas anyway. So um, uh, the idea, first of all, that mindfulness begets mindfulness, uh, it comes from the fact that the form, the standard explanation of sati sampajanya which is mindfulness and full awareness, yeah? that, that exposition is found in the Satipatthana Sutta. And because Satipatthana is about meditation practice, yeah, then it, the conclusion is that, well, this is how you meditate in daily life. They call it daily life meditation, because that is included in the Satipatthana Sutta. But actually, if you understand what is going on really well, yeah, you find that the same formula for Satya Sampajanya, mindfulness and clear comprehension, is also found earlier on the path. Yeah? It is found together with basically right effort. And so then the question is, well, how come it is in two places? It is both under right effort and also under right mindfulness. What is going on? Can the same thing be two different things? And the answer to that, when you really go and study this in quite a little bit of detail, it actually belongs in the earlier part of, path, of the path, not in Satipatthana practice. And so it is not a mindfulness in daily life, right? And once you get that, the whole paradigm is shifted. The whole idea of what this is about shifts. The vast majority of the world will take this to be a Satipatthana practice. I say it is not. And, uh, and it really, it is because of this alternative way of thinking about the Satipatthana Sutta. And once you see it in this way, you realize that Satisampajanya is part of the idea of sense restraint. The purpose of it is actually to avoid defilements of the mind. As I said before, you are mindful in daily life so as to keep the mind pure, build up good qualities, and avoid the negative quality. That is why you're mindful in daily life. You're not mindful for mindfulness's sake. You're mindful for a much more profound sake, keeping your purity, keeping your precepts, having a pure mind. That is the purpose of this. So then, if you look at what, if you go to the Satipatthana Sangyutta, these are the connected discourses on Satipatthana, the 47th chapter of the Sangyutta Nikaya, the connected discourse of the Buddha, you go to Sutta number 3, I think it is, or 4, one of them is called the Bhikkhu Sutta, it is found in a few places in that Sangyutta, and it gives you two conditions for practicing Satipatthana, two foundations for practicing Satipatthana, and those two foundations are said to be sila, and ujjuka ditti. Ujjuka, ujjuka means straight. In fact, the word ujju is directly related to the English word right and the English word straight. Rujju in Pali yeah, sounds almost like right, rujju. So these are same root, same 
basically the same language. Yeah? We talk about the Indo-Aryan languages or Indo-European languages, and many, many words in common between these languages. Uh, Ujjo and straight, Ujjo and right, same thing. Yeah? That is where you find it. Uh, and uh, I will come back to this later on, because this is a very interesting part uh, of this. Uh, why is right view important for meditation practice? Uh, yeah? How does it help us? Uh, I've already given you a few hints uh, uh, that right view helps you to see where real happiness is to be found, uh, right? Uh, the more clarity you have about that, the more you will pursue the real happiness rather than the fake happiness. Uh, fake is becoming a very interesting word these days, so it's good to use some uh, the modern terminology, fake happiness. Uh, not just fake news, but fake happiness as well. Uh, that's really fake news, isn't it? Uh, fake happiness. Uh, that's the kind of the highest kind of fake news. Uh. <laughs> So, um, so there you are. That's kind of the, a little bit on the, uh, the background for that. Uh, yeah, so practice in mindfulness in daily life. How to do that? Uh, uh, you should have enough mindfulness uh, to be able to be aware of your conduct. Uh, yeah? you be able to have purity in action, purity in speech, uh, ideally also purity in mind. Uh, that is quite hard to be fully pure in mind. Uh, but that is the ideal. That is the purpose of mindfulness in daily life. Uh, sufficient to be able to do that. Uh, then you're okay. Uh, don't just be mindful for mindfulness's sake, uh, but do it for this purpose. Uh. Ooh, okay. Uh, dear Ajahn, thank you for your very interesting teachings of the Breath Sutta. This is only the beginning, by the way. There's more interesting coming later on, so stay tuned. Uh, please clarify. Did Ajahn say the breath meditation in the Kaya Nupassana is a late addition uh, to the Satipatthana and not in the original? Uh, please. Um, also, what does mindfulness of the breath body mean? Is it the kaya body or observing the uh, beginning and the end and the, and the whole breath? Thank you. Okay, I will, I will come to that question later on, the second one, because uh, this is part of going into the Anapanasati Sutta, because it has you know, the, the long breath, the short breath, the whole body, right? And what does that mean? That's exactly the question you are asking here. So I will discuss that. Uh, because it is an interesting question there. Um, did I say that uh, the uh, uh, breath meditation does not belong to the Kaya Nupassana? Yes, that's exactly what I said there. And uh, the, uh, the, reason, uh, uh, the reason for that is because breath meditation is the entire Satipatthana, right? It does not belong in one place. It is the entire Satipatthana that is practiced through the breath meditation. How do we know that? Uh, and the way that you know these kind of things, uh, I mean, you, not knowing is maybe too strong a word, but the, the way we can assume that this is true, yeah, it seems to be the case, uh, is by doing what they call a comparative study of these suttas. Uh, I mentioned that briefly before, you take all the existing versions of the Satipatthana Sutta in different languages, in different traditions, uh, and you compare them, and you have something like seven or eight different versions. Uh, and when you compare them, uh, you find that breath meditation uh, is not always found uh, under Kaya Nupassana, under body contemplation. It is only found out in, I think, four or three out of seven sources. Uh, so the conclusion then is that if it is missing in many sources, uh, it is quite likely that it has been added later on. Uh, when you start to uh, look at uh, the various versions, they vary enormously. Yeah? And the feeling you get is that the Satipatthana Sutta had a common core that started and kind of was available to everyone. And then the various different schools, uh, they developed that Sutta in their own ways. Uh, because the Satipatthana Sutta, the way it is structured, is very easy to add things. Yeah? It has a kind of a structure of, uh, you know, kind of blocks, block structure is very easy to add things. And many things seem to belong to Satipatthana. And so many schools, they added different things. For example, the Sarvasti Vadan school, they added jhanas to Kainupasana. Contemplation of the body, they added the four jhanas. They added light perceptions of light. 
all of this kind of thing that is not found in the Pali version. So which one is right? Well, probably, you know, these have been added later on because they're only found in the Sarvasti Vagna school then. But the one thing that is found in all the schools, and this is why it is the most authentic part of it, is the 31 parts of the body. Where is it 32? 31 or 32? 32? Who says 31? Who says 32? Okay, we should have this kind of voting, right? How many? Who's the 31? Who's the 32? Almost everyone says 32. If you ask people, they say, oh, 32 parts of the body. But actually, it is 31, you know. Yeah? <laughs> and this is very interesting. Yeah? It is not interesting because when you contemplate 31 or 32, because that makes, any difference. that makes no difference at all. But it's interesting because in the Sutta, it's 31. In the Visuddhimagga, it is 32. Mm -hmm. And everyone knows what's in the Visuddhimagga. No one knows what's in the Sutta. <laughs> and this is typical of kind of Buddhists. Yeah? We know the commentaries, we don't know the suttas. Yeah? And so I'm just making that point just to show that you know, we tend to be biased towards the commentaries. We read the suttas through the lens of the commentaries. Yeah? So, uh, so I was tricking you there because I apologize for that. <laughs> but you're very brave to raise your hands. I'm very, I'm very glad you did that. Yeah? So this is how we find out. And what you then discover is that the 31 parts of the body, that is probably the earliest aspect of Satipatthana. Second one that comes very close to that is the uh, four elements, which is found in all versions bar one. Yeah? So six out of seven versions. Yeah? And then the rest are, are more dodgy. Yeah? So these are kind of the two most authentic parts of the body contemplation here. Yeah? Uh, when it comes to feeling contemplation and contemplation of mind, it is more equal across the board. There is less kind of problems with it. When it comes to the last one, contemplation of dhammas, again, vast varieties. The two most earliest part of that is the five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening. The rest are unlikely to be early. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? And that kind of changes our view of things quite dramatically. And one reason why this is so interesting is because this kind of research is not usually known in Theravada circles. If you went to Burma and you told the Burmese Satipatthana teachers what I'm saying now, they will burn you at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, right? Because this is, will be considered very, very, very controversial, what I'm saying now. Yet, I don't have much doubt that it is true. Because this is one of the great benefits of uh, the modern uh, era where we have access to a much broader range of texts. Uh, yeah, we have access to the Chinese, we have access to the Tibetan, we have access to different schools of Buddhism, all of these kind of things. Uh, it gives us an alternative view of these texts that is far broader than the traditional one. Uh, and it will take time before traditional uh, Buddhist countries actually see what is going on. Because if you are from a traditional Buddhist country, uh, yeah, the tradition is so strong. It takes time for, for things to kind of... I think it's obvious once you understand it, uh, but still it takes time for the kind of the information to get uh, taken up in, in those societies. Uh. So in a sense, uh, it is an advantage not to be part of that traditional Buddhist scene uh, because it opens up new avenues. Uh, and this is one of those avenues it opens up. Uh. People, there are people in the traditional Buddhist countries who are already seeing these things, yeah, because it is kind of obvious once you recognize it. Uh, but uh, it takes time for these changes to happen. Uh. So uh, anyway, there you are. That's kind of uh, what that is about. Uh. All right. Uh, so, dear Ajahn, uh, um, are the Mahasi Guenka, Zen, etc. methods uh, a derailment, <laughs> derailment from the path? Okay, <clears throat> I have a tendency to try many ways, perhaps to procrastinate. I don't want to waste any more time. Please advise uh, and thank you for uh, the inspiring talk. Yeah. All right. Is it a derailment from the path? It's very, it is, would be too much for me to say. It is a derailment from the path. 
uh, because some of the things I say may also be a derailment from the path, right? Uh, no one is 100% reliable. Uh, and this is kind of the problem. Uh, so, uh, but I, what I would say is that uh, uh, Goenka retreat and Mahasi technique, they are much more um, reliant on Abhidhamma and commentaries uh, than what I prefer myself. Uh, yeah? Abhidhamma is not the word of the Buddha. Commentaries are obviously not the word of the Buddha because they are precisely commentaries on the word of the Buddha. So they can't really be the word of the Buddha. So they are not the word of the Buddha. And so it is, is easy to go wrong. Uh, and uh, I, there may be some people who have success with the Mahasi tradition, but there's also problems with the Mahasi tradition. Yeah? There's a tendency to overestimation, there's a tendency to think you are enlightened. Uh, I have had people come to me, uh, yeah? monastics come to me and tell me that uh, I went to the Mahasi retreat, uh, they told me I was a stream enter. Uh, I didn't believe it. Uh, that's a problem, right? Uh, if you're told by the teacher that you are a stream enter, but you don't believe it, uh, <laughs> then there is a problem, obviously not the stream matter in here. Because if you are a stream matter, you would definitely know you are, something has happened. The fact that you don't believe it means that something has gone very wrong. And so um, these are the kind of issues that you find sometimes. And the Mahasa, Mahasa tradition in particular is very much based on the Visuddhimagga. Visuddhimagga has this sequence of vipassana jnanas, which means uh, uh, inside knowledge is. Uh, and these are not found in the suttas. It is not how the Buddha presents uh, uh, insight. It doesn't mean that they are wrong necessarily, uh, but it may mean that they are not required. It may mean that they are easily subject to misunderstanding. Uh, it may mean all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, the Buddha says specifically in the sutta that he taught everything that is required. There's nothing missing in his teachings. Uh, and so then when you start adding things, uh, it is always a little bit dangerous. Uh, uh, the whole Abhidhamma tradition is really just a philosophical tradition that is added to the suit, as you like trying to close all the gaps and make a complete system out of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, and that also can be very dangerous. Uh, so, um, I, you know, you can use these techniques. Uh, you, can, uh, you can try them. Uh, I don't know if I would specifically recommend them. Uh, uh, I would just stick to some very simple teachings. But just watch the breath. Uh, yeah, develop the breath. Uh, stick to the kind of morality of the path. Uh, keep it really, really simple. Uh, and uh, the Buddhist teaching actually is surprisingly simple once you see it in this way. Uh, Zen Buddhism is a completely. It's not, I'm not sure if it can, can be called Buddhism. Actually, it's almost like a different religion. Uh, because it has gone so far and developed so far from actually the original teachings. I don't think they have any of the original teachings at all in Zen Buddhism. So, uh, you know, you can still maybe enjoy Zen meditation, but still have some positive effects. But uh, the likelihood of uh, achieving awakening, as the Buddha taught it with Zen, I think it is very close to zero, to be honest with you. So, um, <laughs> so that's kind of how I see these things. So, uh, it's easy to be very dismiss dismissing of uh, other traditions. If you go to another teacher, they will say, Oh, Ajahn Brahm's teaching, whoa, that's terrible, yeah, not going to get you anywhere. Don't go to Ajahn Brahm, right? So, every teacher tends to be like this. We all tend to dismiss each other. Yeah? So, that's kind of the, <laughs> that's the danger with these kind of things. Yeah? So, uh, don't take this too seriously, what I'm saying. Tr if you wish to try it out for yourself, you can. Yeah? But my main point is that it is not really based sufficiently, in my opinion, on the early teachings, and it can lead you astray for that reason. However, if you do get good results, if you do find it gives you, makes you peaceful, if it does fulfill the Noble Eightfold Path, then great. One of the dangers of these traditions is that they often tend to uh, discourage you from attaining Samadhi, for example. Yeah, they discourage the jhanas, for example. That is very problematic because they are part of the Noble Eightfold Path. So they are discouraging you from, from practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. And in that case, it is very, very problematic. So, um, yeah, anyway, so maybe that's enough about uh, those various uh, schools. Uh,
Okay, how to hold the right view in stressful situations? Um, everything is more difficult in stressful situations. Yeah, right view is more difficult. Morality is more difficult. Everything is more difficult. Clarity of mind is more difficult. Uh, everything tends to fall apart in stressful situations. Uh, so, uh, best thing is to avoid stressful situations. Uh, and uh, that is not always possible, I appreciate that, uh, but uh, sometimes if you live your life wisely, you can avoid stressful situations, at least to some extent. Uh, and one way of doing it is, uh, for example, to choose a job that is not too stressful, right? Uh, uh, don't, you know, some of these jobs are really, really demanding, uh, like, uh, I don't know, working for McKinsey and company, some of that, uh, they demand really hard work, right? Or some of these investment banks, yeah, stay clear of those. Uh, <laughs> and uh, because uh, some of these things, they're all about prestige and money. And uh, honestly, who is interested in all that prestige and money? You're going to die anyway. Everything is going to have to go, right? Uh, Seriously, if you think about it, it makes no sense to spend your entire life building up prestige and money before you know it, you're going to have to give it all up again. And in the meantime, you have wasted your time, you haven't done anything spiritual, you've done bad things because you were stressed out, and you die with regret in your mind, and you have to kind of uh, deal with the consequences afterwards. Is that what you want? You can see how this idea of rebirth actually is incredibly important because it changes your entire idea of what is important in the world. Uh, your investment strategy changes. Uh, don't go to Goldman and Sachs uh, to ask about investments. Uh, Goldman and Sachs, they have no idea about long-term investments. Short-term investments. Buddhist monastics, the Buddha, he knew about long-term investment. Uh, come to us, uh, we will tell you about long-term investment. Uh, <laughs> But it's true, right? If you have this kind of multi-life idea, it changes your whole idea of how to kind of invest for the future. Actually, it's very interesting here, because this is what investment really is about. So, try to reduce worldly ambition. When you reduce worldly ambition, you also reduce the stress in life. Yeah. Should you have children or not? Sometimes people have this idea, oh, should I have kids or not? If you want an easy life, I would say don't have kids. Uh. <laughs> I don't know, to me it sounds incredibly stressful to have children. I, there's no way I would ever have, even if I was a laborer, I don't think I would have children, to be honest with you. It sounds just really like a real dukkha. But, uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, some people think it is meaningful to have children. And if you are that kind of person, of course, it's, it's, I'm not saying it is wrong. Yeah? It is neither right nor wrong. Yeah? It is just one of those things. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but the idea is to uh, be wise. Remember that the most important thing in life is to develop your spiritual qualities. Uh, that is one of what is going to be for your long-term benefit, uh, right? Uh, so try to guide your, your life in such a way uh, that it gives rise to those good qualities. Uh, if you really are in stressful situations, uh, you just have to uh, remember, most importantly, uh, right view may go out of the window, uh, but just remember kindness. Uh, yeah? If you can remember that one word in stressful situations, uh, and often what that means is not to speak too much when you are stressed out, uh, because the things that come out of your mouth are likely to be a bit irritable or a bit difficult, right? Uh, so be quiet, don't say too much, uh, remember to be kind, uh, remember to be kind to yourself, uh, and uh, that one word, kindness, is really sufficient sometimes in stressful situations. Uh, and uh, this should be the thing that is at the back of our minds at all times, uh, to be kind in all situations of life. Uh. Okay, so when uh, I am busy, I find I wake up with my mind full of what I have to do. Uh, this interferes with my meditation. Uh, what advice do you have? Uh, um, yes, uh, this is a, a, this obviously is a big problem, and this is kind of one of the great reasons why you are a monastic. Yeah, because then you are less busy. Uh, 
you are um, you have few duties. You have few, ideally, you have few duties. It depends a bit on who you are. If you're venerable chanda, you have many duties. And if you are Ajahn Brahmali, you have few duties. Yay! <laughs> Sorry, venerable. <laughs> I'm being very naughty now. <laughs> so uh, it depends, right? This is one of the reasons I like to be at Bodhi Nanamanas because Ajahn Brahm is the boss. I can hide behind Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? Ajahn Brahm is very big, it's very easy to hide behind him. <laughs> This is kind of my strategy, right? So, uh, anyway, so the um, so what you have to do again is this idea of prioritizing, yeah, remembering what is important. Uh, yes, you may be busy, but how important are those busy things anyway? Uh, are they really going to? Are you going to create your future by thinking about all that business, by trying to sort it out in your meditation? Uh, by uh, all of these kind of things? Or are you going to create your future by meditating now, being peaceful, being kind, clearing your mind, making it ready for the day ahead? Yeah, If you have a clear mind, you will be able to deal with the business anyway, because a clear mind tends to put things in a nice order of priorities. Yeah, It tends to kind of know what you have to do, and it is able to focus properly on the projects for the day ahead. So use that uh, as, a, as a baseline to kind of let go a little bit. Uh, if you do think about all of those things during your meditation, you come out of it, your meditation, you are tired already, yeah, because <laughs> you've been thinking too much. And then, of course, you don't have that power in the mind to enable you to go through the day. Yeah? And so it is really counterproductive to think during your meditation. So remember, all of those worldly things, they don't matter. Yeah? They're irrelevant. Uh, what is the worst thing that can happen to you if you don't think about those things? The worst thing that can happen is you get fired. <laughs> if you get fired, it's not such a big deal, right? So, so what? It means you can meditate more, you can go to the monastery, you can do all these kind of things. If that is the worst thing that can happen, no worries, right? Okay, I don't have to think about anything here. So sometimes you think about the worst case scenario, and really actually the worst case scenario is actually a pretty good scenario, so let me not worry too much about this. And then when you give up this idea that you are going to solve the problems of the day in your meditation by thinking about it, in fact you're going to solve it by not thinking about it, by having a good heart, by being peaceful, by wishing all the people around you well, by having a sense of compassion, that is how you create your future. Once you get that, why on earth would you want to think about anything here? So reflect on ideas like this again and again and again, right? The real way of creating the future is actually not what I think it is. It is not by thinking it through, by kind of making plans or whatever. It is by being peaceful that I create the future now. Because this is the mind I will take with me. Uh, eventually when I have to pass away or whatever. I'm building up those qualities now more and more and more. Uh, that is what I want to do with my life. Uh, so it is not that difficult to do. Uh, it's just that you have to change your, this is about right view again, change your priorities, uh, understand what really matters in life. Uh, that is what it really comes down to. Uh, I'll probably talk more about this later on because it is a very important part of uh, the path is really about turning away from the five sense world and turning the way, the mind towards meditation instead. Yeah. So we have come to the last question for the evening, yeah. and it is as follows: Dear Ajahn, when the body dies, does the mind, the stream of consciousness, still perceive sights, sounds, smells, taste, and touches? How does this stream of consciousness navigate to the next rebirth? And how long does it take from one human death to another rebirth? Be it animal, human, insect, deity. Thanks for uh, sharing your knowledge and clarity. That's very, there's a lot of details there. So, um, um, does the mind perceive sight, sound, smells, taste? Yes, it does, right? I'm not sure if it perceives all of these things, but it certainly perceives many of them. And that's kind of interesting, yeah. Because, uh, you know, how is that possible when you, the body is kind of gone? And part of the reason why it is possible is because uh, you then have a mind-made body here. Yeah. 
In the sutta, this is explained as if you have a straw. You know, when you have a straw, you can pull like the another straw from inside. It's like the, the outer sheath c comes off and you have the other straw, right? Uh, and the other straw looks pretty much like the old straw. You're just kind of pulling out the outer skin, so to speak. Or like a snake shedding its skin. Similar kind of idea. So it's like when you emerge from your body, you have another body. It's called a fine material body. And this is kind of common. Yeah, people have near-death experiences. They emerge from their body and they're still there. Yeah, it's just that it's a lighter body, it's a more pleasant body. It's not the heavy body that we have as human beings. So you still have the ability to see and hear and all of these kind of things. It may, of course, be that if you go, if you have a if you, if you die and you're kind of moving towards a jhana or samadhi state, uh, then you may not have these uh, 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 sense organs anymore. Uh, but for the majority of people, you will still have them when you kind of, when the stream of consciousness goes on, uh, because you have a fine material body. It is specifically said in the suttas that it is ahin indriya. Ahin indriya means not inferior in faculties. Uh, yeah, so you have a body which has the faculties of ordinary, of human beings, similar kind of faculties, specifically said in the suttas, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, how does this you know, cause navigate to the next rebirth? Well, it kind of navigates by itself. Yeah, it's kind of drawn by kamma. Kamma kind of drives you on. And uh, very often you will judge yourself. There is a nice sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya 3s uh, where you go to Yama. Yama is like the Lord of Death. Uh, yeah? And then the Lord of Death, uh, he says to you, well, you know, how, you know I, I've heard you did this and this. And, oh, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't really understand. Oh, please forgive me. But uh, you are an adult. You're a responsible person. You did all of these things. Uh, oh, yeah, but please, no, whatever. I, you know, I made a mistake. Uh, well, you're going to have to experience the karma of those things. And so you can see what is happening here. Sometimes this is taken to mean that Yama, the Lord of Death, kind of judges you. But that is not what is going on. Yama is like reminding you of what you have done. And this is very similar to the idea of the, uh, the life review that you often hear about when you death experience. Yeah? You are reviewing your own life. You are reminded of your own actions, good and bad. And then you judge yourself. And this is the idea of self-judgment, which I think is very powerful. So this whole process is like an automatic process. You judge your own life. You see what is going on. And then as you judge yourself, your consciousness is just drawn automatically to whatever realm that matches that self-judgment. If you feel bright and happy, the mind will tend to go to bright and happy realm. In fact, you are already in that bright and happy realm because that is the state of your consciousness. But if you judge yourself badly, you will feel in a more darker place. And so you are already in a darker place. And so you continue like that in your next life. And that is how this process kind of happens. So, <clears throat> This is the so navigation pretty much happens by itself. Uh, how long does it take from one human death to another rebirth? That depends entirely on many, many factors. Uh, sometimes it can be immediate. Uh, so if the kamma is very strong, for example, if you have ability to attain deep samadhi, you may just enter that samadhi as you die uh, and get reborn straight in the jhana realm with that almost zero intermediate life. Uh, or if you have done some really, really bad karma, you make it, you know, get kind of, you know, go to bad realm very, very quickly. But to the majority of beings, after they die, they will go to the what is known as the antarabhava, the intermediate existence, which for Theravadans don't exist, but I'm not a Theravadan, so I believe in it. <laughs> I believe in the Buddha. I'm the kind of Buddhist of the Buddha. I don't really care so much about Theravada or Mahayana, these kind of things. And according to the suttas, it fairly clearly there is such a thing as the Antarabhava, intermediate existence. So you go there, and how long you stay there seems to be flexible, depending on all kinds of things. Yeah, And you kind of are there until the time you are ready to be reborn, until your kamma takes effect, until you have had that life review or whatever it is required for the kamma to really work its way out. And then you get reborn accordingly. Yeah? 
So the more bad karma you have, the quicker the rebirth will tend to be. The more good karma you have, the more quicker the good rebirth will tend to be. If you're kind of intermediate, that's where it seems to take some time for things to uh, work themselves out. Uh, so something like that uh, yeah, is what is going on with rebirth. That is how I understand the suttas. Uh, I have to admit that this is a little bit counter to the traditional Theravadan view. The traditional Theravadan view is that rebirth happens straight away. You have what is called the uh, Chuti Chitta. It is like the uh, Chuti means like passing away. Chitta is mind, the passing away mind. The next mind, mo mind moment is called the Patisandhi Vinyana, which means the rebirth link in consciousness. Uh, so you go from one life to the next one straight away. Uh, and uh, to me, that does not look quite right. Uh, it, to me, it is fairly clear that there is an intermediate state uh, in the suttas. And in fact, there were early schools of Buddhism who argued that precisely. And they were arguing with the Theravadans. Uh, and of course, uh, the Theravadans, in the Theravadan books, the Theravadans are always right. Uh, that's why you have Theravadan books, yeah. <laughs> But uh, if you look at those arguments, I would, to me it looks like they were not right in this particular case. Uh, so, uh, which is kind of interesting here. Yeah. It has some interesting implications about uh, uh, what we should do on our deathbed, how important is it to think the right thought on your deathbed, these kind of things. It has some very interesting implications for that. Uh, but um, I'm feeling too tired now to talk about it. Uh. So we'll talk about that tomorrow if you have a chance. Uh. So if you're interested, please ask a question about that tomorrow. So, that is all for tonight. So, I wish you all a very good night. Please have a wonderful rest and wake up tomorrow morning full of energy and ready for some more meditation. And before we call it a evening, let's just pay respect to the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, do the Arahang, Sama, and Buddha together here. Sangha Namah